Today we're looking at some of the most iconic, unbelievable, world famous watches ever in the world ever, and we're going to see just how much of a disappointment they are. Grab your puncture repair kits and gather around because this is going to be a real letdown. We start with a watch that makes the unicorn look like your average run-of-the-mill bin-scavenging raccoon, the Rolex Daytona. This rarity has a longer waiting list than a Floridian funeral parlour. It's so obscenely popular that even NASA wanted some to take to the moon. Oh no, wait! They didn't. And that's not because NASA didn't have the patience to wait for the call. The Daytona just wasn't good enough. Not only that, but the hastily renamed Cosmograph which had a brief spell as the Le Mans, couldn't even tempt the average Joe on the street. Dealers were throwing them in as freebies to get shot of them, which is perhaps how Paul Newman's wife Joanne Woodward so happened to end up with one to gift him. Speaking of Paul Newman, the exotic dialed watch he wore that ended up fetching $18 million at auction was just one of a handful of Daytona pieces that featured the unusual design. Shame then that, one, it was so rare because people at the time hated them, and two, the design wasn't unique to Rolex at all, a catalogue part that was used by many other watchmakers at the time, including, but not limited to, Lip, Wagman, Volcane, Bouchera, Nevada, and Wittenauer. Imagine being credited for something as monumentous as laying out the blueprint for the modern wristwatch. That's quite an achievement, and one that Patek Philippe can lay claim to with the 1930s Calatrava. As a brand that's always put its best foot forward, never shying away from innovation, it's entirely fitting that it would be Patek Philippe to do so. Except the truth isn't quite so glamorous. You see, Patek Philippe was famous for its pocket watches, especially its complicated ones, with the wealthy elite competing to commission the most ornate and complex yet. So, when the Great Depression happened and everyone lost everything, it was in a bit of a bind. Even those who still had a bit of cash didn't fancy wandering the streets with a shiny gold ball on the end of a chain like some kind of fishing lure. Carrying on like that couldn't have been worse if they'd stopped off at an orphanage along the way to gloat about their parents. So stumped, Patek Philippe put the business up for sale. As in, that's it, I give up, sell the company, let's move to the mountains. Funnily enough, Jacques David Lecoult of Jeuge Lecoult fame was actually offered the business, which he turned down. F's in chat. The watchmaker was finally purchased, not by a wealthy lord or a titan of business, but by the family that made Patek Philippe's dials, the Stearns. Same family that owns them today. They knew the wristwatch was going to be the next big or rather little, thing, and so they committed sacrilege and had one designed for Patek Philippe. Genius move in hindsight, but back then it was like Ferrari making a pickup truck. Speaking of Jeja Lecoult, a brand that had done more to make other watchmakers look good rather than sorting itself out first, the race to the wristwatch was a chance it saw to break out from behind the shadow and into the big leagues. The idea? A wristwatch that could be reversed so the fragile crystal was protected. This likely came as a response to the criticism of the fragility of a wristwatch compared to a pocket watch, which could be locked down front and back in a full metal jacket. The mechanism to do the reversing was so complex and over-engineered that Jeuge Lecoult actually forgot how to do it. In the meantime, we'll talk about how Patek Philippe almost bought the rights to the Reverso, making a handful of prototypes before committing to its own Calatrava. Jeuge Lecoult was hedging its bets, you see, and it was right to do so. That's because the incredibly Art Deco Reverso, being the 1930s child that it was, quickly fell out of fashion. It went the way of bell-bottom jeans, never to be seen again. Or it would have done if one Italian dealer by the name of Giorgio Corvo hadn't spotted some old, unfinished reversos at the factory. They were cased up for him and were sold in a shot. Corvo asked for more, but drew a blank. They'd forgotten how to make it. Long story short, the watch was reverse engineered and the complex mechanism restored to the Jeuge Lecoult catalogue. It's since been updated too to feature a secondary face and even function on the reverse. That's because, let's face it, turning it over and seeing a blank piece of steel is kind of disappointing. 
If you're a reader wondering what to read next, why not check out one of my novels, available from Amazon from the link in the description below. They're available on Kindle, paperback, and audiobook. Thanks very much. The International Watch Company has had a fascination with aviation since 1936. That's because the owner at the time, one Ernst Jacob Homberger, had three very spoilt sons who all enjoyed flying. Switzerland had literally only just introduced its private pilot's license and they were there, Hans, Alexander and Rudolf begging daddy to make them a special pilot's watch so they could brag about it to their pals. And it's just as well they did because the pilot's watch is what kept IWC afloat. The design we know today, however, didn't originate from the 1936 pilot's watch, but instead from a design IWC was obliged to make for the Luftwaffe. It's a bit like, you know, when your parents asked you as a kid if you wanted to put your jacket on because it was cold outside. They weren't really asking. By way of sweet revenge, IWC took that exact design and shrank it down for use by the RAF once the war was over, furnishing RAF and Commonwealth pilots with Mark 11 watches from as early as 1948. Talk about rebound. There was no Stockholm syndrome going on here. That watch has gone through the marks to today's Mark 20, but really not much has changed. And for a watch that's been around the block so many times, that's seen so many things, it's really plain. It's supposed to be. That's the point, of course. It was designed to be rugged, reliable, and legible. And that's it. It's a bit like seeing Churchill's hat in person. Your life doesn't change or anything. You're just like, huh. Strapping one on, unfortunately, doesn't turn you into a handsome fighter pilot with a sideline interest in alternative religion. If you walk into a Patek Philippe store today and your name isn't Ed Sheeran, if you ask for a Nautilus, you will be laughed out the shop so hard you'll need therapy. If you thought the Daytona was hard to come by, the Nautilus makes it look like you can get them three for the price of two at the gas station. Why is the Nautilus so popular? Did it define a generation, revolutionize the industry, change the technical game? It did literally none of those things. It was a flagrant copycat watch built to save Patek Philippe's bacon again. Remember how the company sold out and made the wristwatch in the 1930s? Well, in the 1970s, it was back at it. Wouldn't be so bad if it was a last ditch attempt to do something crazy, but that credit goes to Audemars Piguet. They got young designer Gerald Genta to go hog wild, let him loose to do whatever he wanted, and he did. He designed the craziest watch the world had ever seen, the Royal Oak. What did Patek do? They got Gerald Genta, yes, same guy, to give them the design that didn't quite make it. The also ran, the Nautilus. Where the Royal Oak was refined, unusual but interesting, the Nautilus was kind of a mess. Flappy ears that did nothing, a bezel that didn't know if it was square or round or octagonal or what, and a dial that was basically a half-finished version of the Royal Oaks. Not to mention the watch itself. It's supposed to be a luxury sports watch. The Royal Oak is chunky and sturdy and robust. By comparison, the Nautilus feels like a damp noodle. They've improved the clasp for the latest white gold 5811, but otherwise, it's a watch that lets down the hype worse than episode one. What iconic watch do you think has a disappointing side? Let me know down in the comments below. Please do like and subscribe as well, and I'll see you over on the Watchfinder channel. Goodbye.